I was born and raised in a uh, very conservative Amish community. Uh, it's very, very different than the Amish that are in Lancaster. It's like pioneer style. Like we didn't have any like running water, indoor bathrooms, um, no refrigerators, no freezers. Uh, so when we moved to Lancaster, I was 15 years old. We thought we were living a good Amish life. <laughs> So that was awesome because we had running hot water, we had refrigerators, we had freezers. There's a lot more freedom here for the Amish. So where I lived was very, very small. And um, most of the roads that we traveled on were like narrow, gravel dirt roads. And um, so we got to Lancaster because my mom remarried. She was a widow for 12 years. And then my stepdad was from Lancaster. So when they remarried, we moved to Lancaster. Um, dated an Amish guy for a few years. Thought I was going to get married. And then when it came down to it, I realized I didn't want to get married. So uh, I left. I left before I was baptized. And um, when I left, of course, my parents shunned me for about three years. My mom, my dad, they, they wouldn't speak to me. In Lancaster, it's very, it's more open. Like if you're not a member of the church, yeah. it's up to each person and your parents whether they're going to shun you or not. If you are a member of the church, which means if you already got baptized, then Everyone that's a member has to follow the rules of the shining or they can get shunned as well. So my parents shunned me. Uh, they're really pretty conservative and strict. So they shunned me for about three years. It was, it was challenging, you know, um, and I wasn't even, I hadn't even fully left the Amish, like I was New Order Amish. And so I still wore the dresses and the coverings, but the church I went to, we just drove cars and had electricity. So my mom and I, were good now. I mean, we have a good relationship. Uh, we have a solid relationship. I, it took a lot of rebuilding. And she, well, she actually had written me a letter one day and she said she wanted to come over and talk. And so we sat down and we talked and that was the first time I talked to my mom in like three years. And um, kind of, agree to disagree, you know, put our differences. I just didn't view things the same way that she did. And sure. I always had questions. I didn't just blindly follow the rules of the religion. I wanted to know why. And in that culture, the way I grew up was that's a sign of disobedience. If you question why, and if you question the rules of the culture, it's you're disobedient. And so I was always, uh, reprimanded for that because I wanted to know why. Like, why do we have to wear the coverings? Yeah. Where does that come from? Who made those rules and why did they meet those rules? And, you know, why do we have to dress like this? And I always had questions. I was very curious. And at the time, it was just, I wanted to, I don't know. I just, I had, I wanted to understand. Um, I had already gotten spanked for it <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> because um, my, to my mom, it was disobedient, you know, and, um, I was taught that not being content with what you have um, is the devil, you know. Yeah. And so for a long time, I had kind of uh, given up on wanting more in life. And it, it tell you what, it's a challenge to overcome that, mon to overcome that mindset yeah. when you're so taught that you have to be satisfied with what you have or when you're, um, when you're taught a limited mindset, meaning like when you're taught that um, you, this is the card you're dealt with, this is your life, sure. and that's all there is to it. Like, this is what you have. Be happy with it, be content. And so when you have that mindset, it's, it takes a lot to overcome that and to realize, you know what, this is your life, but you're also in charge of your life. You're in charge of sure. creating your life. And once I learned that, to me, that was one of the greatest, it was exciting. Like, yeah. I was like, wow, like, I can do, I can decide what I want to be. It's not, my life is chosen for me. My future is chosen for me. Growing up Amish and being in that culture, it, it is like your life is planned out for you. Like you're expected to be like everyone else. You know, you grow up, you get married, you have kids, you're a housewife, and you know, that just, that's your path. That's what you're supposed to do. And um, I got into the television industry. That really just fell into my lap. Um, I always talked about being successful, but I didn't really have a plan. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I just, I knew I wanted to be successful, and that was when I first left. And I talked about success all the time and how badly I wanted to be successful in life. And um, then Alan Byler, which was one of the, he's called the Black Amishman. Yeah, he was on the yeah. Amish Mafia. And he's the one that came to me the one day 
and I had met him through a mutual friend, and he said, hey, Esther, he's like, I had these producers coming from New York. They want to do a show. They asked me if I know Amish people. He's like, do you want to come and meet them? And I didn't really believe at the time that it was legit, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to go. And we met them and we shot, that day we shot like a, um, a sizzle reel and they had me out in the middle of the field like singing some country song. It was awesome. <laughs> so, but out of that then came um, Breaking Amish and then Amish Mafia. I was producer for Breaking Amish. Um, so I produced Breaking Amish. I helped cast Breaking Amish. I did wardrobe for Breaking Amish. Um, for that show, I was in New York for six weeks. Um, producing that show and that was the first time that we were I was ever in New York that was completely crazy <laughs> it was pretty awesome so um, and then after that came Amish Mafia and um, Amish Mafia I can't say that it was scripted um, there is a lot of rea reality behind the concept of the show sure. um, obviously a lot of it was embellished for entertainment purposes um, but there's a lot of reality behind that like um, obviously there is no like Amish mafia, so to speak. Like we don't go around blowing people's fruit stands up, but there's what's called an Amish aid, which is the same, the same idea. Okay. That's how that whole idea came is we were talking about Amish aid and how, um, there is one person that controls the whole funding for the Amish community. So twice a year, every Amish person pays into this one person. They go around collecting the money. And then all that money goes into a fund because a lot of Amish people don't have health insurance. So then what happens is if something happens or somebody's barn burns down or if somebody is in the hospital for an extended period of time, the money comes out of that fund to help pay for that. Um, so that's what it's actually for. So that's where the whole show Amish Mafia came from. And um, it, was, it was a great show. It yeah. was, yeah. They never handed us scripts. Uh, they kind of said, um, you know, this is what the scene is supposed to be, and then there you go, you know. So that's how we, how we did the show. Um, and it was, it, was, it was a lot of fun. We had a good time. I did Rome Springer. Up here they started at 16 years old, so I did Rome Springer. It was completely different than what I had known growing up. Like, Ponxatawney Rome Springer and Lancaster Rome Springer are two completely different, like there's no comparison. Like down in Ponxatawney, the girls and guys don't even talk at all. Like say a guy's interested in a girl, they get together every Sunday. Um, it's called what they have a supper and singing at somebody's house. Um, one of the usually where church was that day. And then they'll have a supper and singing and let's say a guy's interested in a girl. He won't go ask the girl directly. If he can take her home, he'll send his friend to ask the girl. And he will say, oh, can Chani take you home? And then he'll try to explain like where the buggy is. And uh, it was the funniest thing ever with my oldest sister. So the buggies all look the same. They're identical. There's no, <laughs> other than maybe the seat cover is a different color, but the buggies all look the same. So when this guy wanted to take my sister home, <laughs> His friend came and asked her and she said, yes, yeah. so he tried to explain where the buggy was. And she went out on the buggy and she was sitting on the buggy waiting. And this guy comes out and is like, uh, har like harnessing his horse, you know, getting his horse in the buggy. And she looks and she's like, uh, that is not the guy. So she had to get out the buggy and go find the right buggy. Uh, but the guys will take the girls home to their home. <clears throat> and then they will stay with the girl until 2 a.m on Monday morning. This is down in Punxsutawney. It's the dumbest, it's the dumbest way to do it. It really is. It's the most conservative community, but it's the dumbest way to date. It's a lot of uh, 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 women that get pregnant out of wedlock down there. And then in Lancaster, um, so you see the open buggies driving around, the ones that have no roof, they're just open yeah. buggies. Those are the really plain conservative Amish. They usually live in Kirkwood, uh, Paradise, Oxford, those places. And their dating ritual is if they're interested in a girl at a supper and sing, and the guy will ask the girl to go for a walk. Okay. And if she says yes, then he'll take her for a walk, like he has her arm around her waist. And the longer the walk, the more he likes her. So, and then the other ones, the ones that drive the buggies and the ones that drive the trucks and the cars, they will ask the girl, can I take you home? And if she says yes, then he'll, they'll uh, take the girl home and then she will invite them in for a snack and they'll sit at the kitchen table 
and she will give them pie, coffee, whatever. She'll serve them a snack and then they'll go home. So usually they'll do that about three to four times and then they'll be considered, like they'll start actually courting. The really plain open buggy ones, they have what's called a guest room. It's called the gooch dope. And it's a guest room and they'll, they'll hold their courtships in there. Like once they're courting, then they'll sit in the gooch dope and um, just visit. It's where all their finest china is and their cabinets and then there's a nice couch in there. And they'll hold their, their, dating, their dates in there. You know, then they'll serve them lunch and dinner. Yeah. So when you turn 16 years old, you have a massive amount of choices of what group you want to join. Oh. And all these groups have names. So they're all different, but they all have names. And you can choose a group depending on what it is that you like. Like some groups party, some groups have hops, which is, um, they'll have like, um, oh, what do you call Like in the barns, like they'll dance, like they have yeah. like hoedowns. It's called a dance and they'll have, um, so if you want to do that, you join a group that does that. If you want to party, you join a group that parties. Or you can choose a group that has the open buggies, the regular buggies, or um, a group that the young men drive, like cars, trucks, whatever. Um, some of the group names are Bluebirds, Souvenirs, Eagles, Cherokees, uh, Cardinals. And it's all um, organized. So when, when I was on Rumspringa, even though I was with, um, I started with what was called the Quakers, and they were one of the, <laughs> they were one of the wildest groups. They, they dressed like they had the real puffy sleeves and like the silky, uh, the silky shiny dress. So I joined them and um, then from the Quakers I went to the souvenirs and we'd have field parties. Um, somebody would say, hey, random text during the day, field party at my house tonight. Okay. We all had phones. Oh yeah, we had the blackberries when they were in, the razors. So um, field party, everyone go and usually the guys would park, um, they'd park their trucks in a circle and have someone have the headlights on and then in the middle, was the keg. They did kegs. Okay. Somebody would be uh, blasting music and everybody would just put their tailgates down and you sat down and you just had a good time. <laughs> but then it was always back in away from the road, you know, so you don't get in trouble for it. And Rome Spring Alaska, it starts at 16 and it lasts until you become a member of the church. So usually, of course, the women are, are expected to join uh, earlier than the men because generally they get married younger. Um, and the men, the more liberal men, like the ones that drive and party and have fun, they um, often will not join church until they're ready to get married. <laughs> Usually though, if you hit 30 and you're a woman or a guy and you're not married yet, you're considered a bachelor or an old maid. Mm -hmm. If a woman hits 30 and she's not married, she has to start um, dressing like, um, like the married woman, because she's considered an old maid. Like basically saying, all right, you're, this is done. So usually that at that point, um, you'll can a lot of men that either lose their wives or widowers will end up marrying an old man. The men then, uh, when they want to get married, they have to because a lot of them will cut their hair. Like they'll have like regular haircuts. So if they join church, they have to let their hair grow back, get rid of their jeans, t-shirts, cars, trucks, radios. If you randomly, if you're driving down like especially 340 and you see a truck or a car sitting out on the road that says for sale yeah. by a field, and he's probably getting married or joining church. When I was on television, you, and I was young, I was very young. So you just assume that this life is gonna go on forever, right? Yes. Um, well, the third season, actually me, John, and JoLynn walked out of the show. That's how it ended like abruptly. So we walked out of the show, it was like a protest because uh, we were upset with uh, the contracts. And what we were told and that with every season that our, what we were getting paid is supposed to double, quadruple, all that. And it didn't. And when we read the fine print in the contract, it said that with each season, you only get a 5% increase, which is not what we were told. And I was like, I was like, I'm, I'm, I just walked out. Uh, and then John and Jolene walked out. So the season is left hanging, like, Everybody's still last, what happened? It's hanging. Like, there's nothing. They had wanted us to come back and make sense as to what happened to us. They offered us each, I think it was about $8,000 really? for it to come and make sense. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, so it's hanging. So it's still, 
yeah, we still talk about that. Um, but then I started speaking. Um, I got into a motivational speaking. Um, I speak for a women's foundation that's called Voices of Hope. And it's a platform for women from all walks of life that have faced abuse of any kind, whether sure. it's sexual abuse, um, domestic violence, just any form of abuse. And it's usually a two-day conference. And we have about six speakers, and then we break it down into uh, breakout sessions where we offer um, coping methods, healing, counseling, just set them up with things like that. Um, and it's, it's really sad because there's a lot of sexual abuse that goes on within conservative communities that's never brought out or that's never talked about because the church always wants to take care of everything within their own. So everything gets swept under the rug or the guy will get shunned and then like, a lot of them won't report it, especially the more conservative. And it's something that we, you really have to fight within the churches, really have to fight. And it was a, a challenge at first when we stepped out, <clears throat> um, one of the women that created the platform because there was, we got a lot of lashback from the Amish communities, um, more so like out in Ohio, Indiana, and in those areas. But there's a lot of um, sexual abuse that goes on um, with young girls, young women, um, very, very little. And so um, we do that and it's, it, our um, last few conferences have, we've been sold out and there's people, women that come in there that are in their 50s and 60s and speaking out for the first time. 90% okay. of the women that come to the conferences are Amish women. And um, I was completely intimidated. I'm not, like the first conference we had, um, and I was supposed to share my story and to speak. I looked across the room, we had a sold out show and 90% of the women in there were Amish. And I was freaking out. I was like, how am I gonna share my story with all these <coughs> Amish women in here? I was like, what is it? Like, you're afraid of being judged and criticized or, you know. And um, what you find out after that is how it opens up so many doors and what I learned is when you learn to step out in bravery you're giving other women the freedom to be brave too and to speak you know their truth and it's been incredible like the impact that we've had has been incredible um, with that and um, I'm writing a book it's called Healing and Heals and I just I share my journey um, I was sexually abused as a child. Um, my, I was 13, 14 years old, and I actually ended up getting pregnant. I was somebody in the community who was an older Amish um, gentleman. And what you're taught within these conservative communities, as a woman, I'm not talking about Lancaster, um, Lancaster is so different in the way that they teach women, but where I grew up and out in these backwoods conservative communities is you're taught as a woman that how do I say it? if a man lusts after you so to speak or if if a man comes after you or molests you it's something that you did that enticed the man so um, that's what I was taught and that's what I was told and I remember one time sharing with my mom I was in fifth or sixth grade and I had a school teacher and he was a male and he was our neighbor and um, he had chased me down the road one day, literally chased me down the road. I was walking, so we didn't have a phone in our homes. Like we had a phone that was shared by the neighborhood. And so we had to walk about half a mile down the road to the phone. And my mom had me walking down to the phone to call someone to go to take us into town. And I'm walking and as I'm walking to the phone, the houses are all like half a mile apart. Like, we didn't have neighbors like this. We were all like half a mile apart and there's nothing but wood. And I'm walking and all of a sudden I hear gravel crunching behind me. And I look and it's my school teacher. And instantly I just felt like weird. Like the, the hair on the back of my neck stood up and I was just like, like, I just was instantly uncomfortable. And so I started walking faster. And as I walked faster, he walked faster. And I started running and he started running. And I was like, I, I was like, what am I gonna do? 
like, what am I going to do? And there was a, an old mill off to the right hand side of the road that was an abandoned mill. And I duck in there, <clears throat> I ducked in there and I was on the outside of the mill and it had the boards where it had the cracks in the middle and I'm crouched on the outside and I'm peeking in and I see him standing in the mill, like just doing this, like he's looking for me. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do? And I got up and I just ran like towards home. I just ran as fast as I could go. And as I ran, um, I heard him calling my name and I turned and looked and he dropped his pants. I was in sixth grade, maybe. And I ran home and I'm like out of breath and panting and I couldn't breathe. And um, my mom, of course, asked what happened and I told her. And she told me, what's something you're doing that's leading him on? And she gave me lessons, like we had lessons. She gave me lessons on how to walk um, so that, you know, make sure that you're not wiggling or swinging your hips like this is how you like we had lessons on how to walk and so that's how I like that was the mentality I had all these years and so when I got pregnant and I was pregnant when we moved to Lancaster I had gotten pregnant down there and then I was pregnant when we moved to Lancaster and so I didn't talk to my mom at all I didn't tell her what happened I didn't tell her I was well, I didn't know I was pregnant. That's a whole nother story. But because we're not taught about, we never have the talk. You are, you never talk about sex. You never talk about men. You never talk about how babies are born. That's something, it's hush hush. You don't ever talk about it. And if you do, you're punished. Like it's a very like, they, they, it, it turns into a dirty thing because you're never, it's never allowed to be talked about. And you're never taught where babies come from, what pregnancy is like, how that is. Um, and I was 14 when I got pregnant and 15 when I had my son. So I, I didn't tell my mom anything. And she asked me uh, one time, she had asked me if I was pregnant. And I remember looking at her and thinking, that's the most ridiculous thing you could ever ask me. Like, I had no idea what pregnancy is or how it is or how it works. And... Um, I was working for my sister. I was her maid um, because she had a baby. So when you have a baby, they usually, a younger girl will go help, you know. And I was working for my sister the day that I went into labor. And I didn't know what labor was. I didn't know how it is when you have a baby or what to expect when you're having a baby. Um, it's not, you know, you don't talk about it. You don't talk about it in school. You don't nothing like you just never hear about it talk about it nothing and so i was working for my sister and it was about 12 12 30 in the morning when um i just had shooting pain like shooting pain i was laying on the couch i'd slept at her house because i had to get up at 3 30 4 o'clock in the morning to pack her husband's lunch and get him off to work and i had shooting pain and i was like Okay, what was that? And you know how when you have a contraction, that's it for a little bit. It goes away and then you don't feel anything again for a while. So I was like, huh. I was like, maybe I have to go to the bathroom. So I went to the bathroom and sat down and thought, you know, maybe I had to go and nothing happened. So I went back out and I laid on the couch and I'm like laying there and I'm almost back to sleep. And all of a sudden I feel this gush, like this burst of water. Like I, feel, I just felt this gush and this worm like liquid and I'm like now why didn't I feel that I had to pee I thought I peed myself and I was so confused because I was like why didn't I feel the urge to pee so I laid there and I'm just like okay what do I do I was like what, what do I do like I didn't know what's going on with my body I didn't know what's going on with me and then the contractions really started hitting and I started having a lot of pain. And it got so intense and I was kneeling. I kneeled on the floor and I just went like this and put my head down and I just laid there and I was just, just started praying and I was just like, God, what is happening to me? And <laughs> I was just, I didn't know what's happening to me and I just, 
I was like, am I dying? Like, you know, am I dying? Like, what's happening to me? And 3.30, 4 o'clock came, and I got up, and I packed her husband's lunch, and I got him off to work. And then the day, st like, that's when my day started, you know. And she had um, a list for me of things that wanted to get done. And um, so I did her laundry. Um, I baked chocolate chip cookies. I cleaned her house. This was, you know, throughout the morning, throughout the day, cleaned her house. Um, and it was about 3.30 in the afternoon. And I kept going to the bathroom and thinking that, you know, and I'd sit down and of course the pressure made it so much worse. And I was like, okay, that's, that's not it. And I'd get back up and I'd go. And me and my sister were never close. We had a very strained relationship. We were never close. And so it wasn't like I felt like I could talk to her and say, this is what's going on. I don't know what's going on. It was 3.30 in the afternoon and I was um, doing her tomatoes. She had a bushel of tomatoes there that she wanted to make into tomato juice. And um, I had my uh, canister out, the big canister, and I cut the tomatoes and I was putting them in there and squeezing them to make the tomato juice. And every time a contraction came, I just like, I would just squeezed the tomato. Like I was at that point, I was in so much pain, so much unbelievable pain. And um, right around that time, it just, it became unbearable. Like I went back to the bathroom again, and that was the worst. And I went back and I laid on her bed and I curled up in a ball and I just started bawling. I was bawling my eyes out. I was sure at that point, I was like, I was sure I was dying. And um, my sister came back looking for me and she found me curled up in a the ball there crying. And um, she went and got my mom and they called a midwife. And the Amish kind of had their own small midwives. It wasn't like women and babies or, you know, they had their own small clinics. And she called a midwife. And the midwife came out and they were gonna take me to the hospital. And that's when my mom explained to me that she said, Esther, you're having a baby. And the midwife said, there's no time to go anywhere. Like, you gotta have it now, you know? And 7.30 that night, I had my son, Jonathan, and mom got him out and she put him, she got him and she put him in my arms. And I felt so disconnected, like, I felt no, because I, I was in shock. Like it was just in that day, like from everything I went through to then being told, oh, you're having a baby to here's your baby. Like it was, it was overwhelming. And I just remember I had this baby in my arm and I'm laying there, I'm looking at him and I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, and um, so mom was like, she showed me how to nurse and breastfeed and, we didn't have anything for that baby. We didn't have diapers, we didn't have clothes, we didn't, like we had nothing for that baby. And um, so later that evening, my sister had, had a little boy, so she had you know, an outfit, but uh, my mom and dad, uh, they took me up to my mom and dad's house. My mom and dad went shopping, got clothes and diapers, and it was, it was, probably, it was the craziest time of my life. And then after that, um, it grew on me, you know, I, I, I was like, okay, I have a baby. And I just stepped up, I was like, okay, well, I'm a mom. And I took care of my baby and I fell in love with my baby, you know? I fell in love with my baby and I did what I needed to do. Um, and then not long, long afterwards, uh, started getting visitors from the church, the preachers and the church people. And I knew they were talking about me, but I didn't know what they were saying, but I knew they were talking about me. I knew they came because of me. And um, the one day mom and dad said, Esther, they said, we need to talk to you. And I said, okay. And they said, the church talked, they talked about your situation and about you having a son at 15 years old and they said that they think it's best if you give up the baby. And I said, what? And mom said, they want you to give the baby up for foster care. 
And I said, well, I'm not going to do that. And they said, well, they don't know how they're going to explain it to the other children in church. If they see you and you're not married with a baby, how are they going to explain it to their kids? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't really care, but I'm not giving up my baby. So um, I guess they gave that message to them. And then a few weeks later, the same thing, concerned parents from the church. They wanted me to give up my baby because we were now going to church and I wasn't allowed to care for my son in public. I wasn't allowed to act like I was his mom when we went to church. Um, I still had to go in with the girls, the young girls, and my mom had to take care of my baby. And they said, if I'm not going to give up the baby for foster care, that's what I have to do. So that's what I did. And I remember telling my mom that I had wanted to go to this job I worked at. I had started working. I was working at Diener's when I was pregnant, too. Um, I was working there as a dishwasher. And I was like, oh, I can't wait to show them my baby. And mom's like, Esther, you can't go show anyone your baby. And the church came, I think the third time they came, and word got around that I had a baby and I was supposed to give up my baby. And I had families come, talk to my parents that wanted to adopt the baby. I said, I am not giving up my baby. I'm not giving him up. He's not for adoption. He's not for foster care. I am not giving him up. And then my parents were like, okay, well, if you're not going to give him up for foster care, why don't you let us adopt him? And I said, okay. I said, if I let you adopt him, I said, are you going to tell him as he grows that you're the grandparents and that his sister is his mom? I said, or is he going to find this out someday because he will find it out? And I said that he's a grown man now and he finds out that his sister is his mom. I said, how do you think that's going to affect his life? And my parents said no, that they wouldn't tell him. And I said, then you're not adopting him. So I ended up uh, 17 years old, I think, 16 or 17 years old. 17 years old, I left home. I, was, I stayed Amish, like I was still Amish, but I left home. And um, me and my mom, had, I, had it, I had it out with my mom again about my son. And I stuffed some clothes in a bag it was a little white uh, grocery bag. And I had my son here and I had my bag here and I went walking out the door. And I knew someone, they lived about a mile and a half away that wasn't Amish, but I had met them um, at a different church. And um, I walked to her house. She, <laughs> she was the only person I knew that could possibly maybe help me or, you know, and I asked her, if I could stay at her house for a little bit. And she said, yeah. So I stayed there for a week, few weeks, got a job, um, then moved somewhere else. And then from there, I started going to a New Order church. And they allowed me to keep my son. And um, they actually kind of, there was a family there who still, we call him Pappy. Like to this day, it's Pappy, you know. But they kind of like adopted Jonathan and I, took us under their wing and um, were just like my other parents. And uh, the church, they helped me find an apartment, a car. They were just really, really good to us and um, taught me a lot, you know, taught me a lot about yeah. life skills and what you need to get through in life. So now we are, you know, working on our own goals and vision. And I eventually, I don't even, I'm not sure when, at what point um, I left New Order that I just didn't want to be Amish at all, um, which kind of was when I, <laughs> I gotten into partying at some point when I was newer. And that's a big no-no, like even in the new order, like you just don't do that, you know. But I felt like I was just, I did what I th was told to do all my life, you know, and I just followed this pattern just because. Sure. And I just did stuff because that's what we were told and that's what we were taught. And at one point I was just like, I just wanted to be free. That was my, I, was, I just wanted to be free. And then 
I still dated a guy within the church for a while. Actually, when I was New Order, I was 18 years old is when I met Levi, London Levi. I met him, I knew him for a long time. And um, <laughs> he had asked me out at, um, we had a staff room singing, we were in Rome Springer, and he had asked me out and I thought he was kidding because we we always joked around. And he had asked me if, if he can take me home and he was sitting out on the, on the tailgate of his truck and he said, he asked her, can I take you home? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, in your dreams and get walking. <laughs> and it was only until he called me that Tuesday and asked me again that I was like, oh. I said, did you mean that on Sunday? And he said, yes. I was like, I thought you were joking. Um, but yeah, then I dated a guy for a few years and I was like, you know what, I don't want this. I was just like, I don't want this. I was so young. And before you can get married, you have to be baptized. New Order or Amish, you have to be baptized. And I was like, I don't want this. Like, I'm not sure that I want to make this kind of a commitment and I'm not sure that it's what I want because Amish people don't believe in divorce. So that's when I broke up and then I left a few months after and um, just kind of been <laughs> figuring my life out since. I f believe truly that I found my purpose and that was um, helping other people, like sharing my story and helping other women and empowering women. And I just want to encourage women to share their stories. Like silence is awful. Like it's awful. And so many of us can relate and we're all, we share the same things, whether even if we haven't been through any type of abuse, we share the same struggles as women. Um, for some reason with a lot of women in general, as a society, it's more of a battlefield with competing against each other and feeling like, you know, tearing each other down instead of building each other up. And I just, I want women to unite and I want women to empower and build each other up and share their stories and to know that you don't have to be ashamed of what you went through. That's the biggest thing is to let go of that, to let go of that shame, to let go of that guilt and, you know, become healthy. Like I grew up without a father. My father passed away really young, so I never had a positive male role model in my life. So I made a lot of, I chose a lot of wrong guys in my life um, that just really ruined me as a woman until I learned that, okay, yeah, these men, I might be like, I was in a, um, abusive relationship for a long time, but then at some point I'm like, okay, why do I keep finding these kind of men? So it made me also take responsibility and hold me accountable and to make me look inside of myself, okay, what is going on here? Why do I keep cho choosing unhealthy men and then entertaining that and getting caught up? So, um, I had to face a lot of hard truths about myself and realize like, okay, something going on here, you know, dig a little deeper. Um, and to learn how to, you know, become healthier. I was also an unhealthy person. And if you don't have a healthy male role model in your life as a young girl growing up, and then all you have is men in your life that abused you or used you, you know, you have to get to a point in your life too where that's affecting your choices and who you choose in partners like that's who we attract if we're not if we don't become aware you can't be afraid to look within and often we do because even if you go to counseling and you get help if you don't fix in what's going on in here you're going to keep repeating cycle after cycle after cycle like get out of that toxic situation and heal yourself and don't be afraid to admit okay you have to admit your flaws and you have to know where you might be a toxic person as well, you know, because you attract how, what you're vibrating is also what you're attracting. So you have to take responsibility without taking blame for another person's action. Take accountability and responsibility, separate yourself and just, you know, don't be afraid to also look at yourself and say, okay, this is, I need to fix this. This is what my issue is. I need to fix it. You know, I was a very, um, I was a very hurt child. You know, I was very hurt. And um, 
we try to cover that up with acting like um, we're heartless or we're cold or we're what now today's term is savage. No, we're not. Yeah. No, we're not. That's all a facade. It's fake. And if you have that mentality, then all that tells me is that you have things going on in here that you need to address. Because when we're whole and we're healthy, you're, we're real. Like We are just who we are, and we don't live based on the approval and opinion of others. You just vibrate in your own truth and in who you are.